اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to Ramadan reflections this being the fourth day of the blessed month of Ramadan for 2022 today we want to look at the topic of prophet Jesus peace be upon him Isa ibn Maryam and his foretelling of the final messenger of Allah now one of the ways which humanity was given knowledge of the preceding prophets that would come from Allah, that successive chain of 124,000 that God had sent. One of the ways that human, humanity were taught who that prophet would be, what the name would be, what the characteristics would be, was through their immediate past prophet. And so we have a precedent even in the Quran of past prophets giving the glad tidings of prophets that would come after them. Obviously, the Quran is not very specific in these details and does not recount every single prophet and those that would come after them. But there are some general uh, principles or general ayat of the Quran in which we do see uh, a prophet speaking to his community of his future successor. Now, as we realize that the prophets of Allah were never in competition with one another. As I said, that based on the hadith that comes to us when Abu Dhar al-Ghifari asked the Messenger of Allah how many prophets Allah sent, and the Prophet Muhammad, may God peace and blessings be upon him, quoted the number 124,000 in total. We recognize that they all had one message, which was to submit to God and to shun the despots. As the verse of the Quran says. So their message was universal. Yes, maybe the methodology behind the acts of worship would have differed. The, the Salat, for example, of Prophet Ibrahim is not like the Salat of Prophet Muhammad. May Allah bless him and his family. The fasting of Nabi Nuh, peace be upon him, is not the same as the fasting that we follow in Islam. But as I said, the prophets are not in competition with one another. They were actually there to help and assist and support the preceding prophets that God was sent. They were all working together in one goal and in one and So naturally, they have to inform their community who would come after them. This would allow their community, that were they to live long enough to see the next prophet, that they could accept that messenger, that they would know what to look for. They would have some indicators. This is even seen in the corporate world today, you know, where you have people who are, the, let's say, the CEO of a company, and if they're going to retire, they're going to make known or there'll be some process by which the uh, next person in charge will be uh, put into that position and they will be made known, that person, who they are. So the question comes for us living in this era that where do we find that guidance? Or where actually even if I take it a step back is where did the previous communities find that guidance on who to follow after their prophet? Well, today we want to look at chapter number 61, Surah uh, Saf, verse number 6, which gives us an indication of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa ibn Maryam, peace be upon both of them, and his uh, foretelling, his in informing his community, not only the people who followed him, but also the Bani Israel, the tribes of Israel whom Jesus was sent to, who would that, of who his successor, who the final messenger would be. And so in chapter 61, verse number 6, we read, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُسَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالُوا هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ And Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, Surely I am the messenger of God sent to you, confirming whatever of the truth is contained in the Torah, which was revealed before me, and bringing the glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmad. But when he came to them, the whole of mankind, including the latter generations of the children of Israel, with the manifest signs of his being God's messenger, they said, this, what he preaches and does, is clearly nothing but sorcery. Now this is the very clear verse of the Qur'an, brothers and sisters, where Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is giving his community, the children of Israel especially, the glad tidings that what he brings, what Prophet Jesus brings, confirms that of the Torah, 
what had not yet been corrupted and adulterated and confused with the truth and mixed with falsehood. But he mentions that there would come after him a prophet whose name would be Ahmad. Now, there are three questions that we need to reflect upon today. And we're going to present these questions and their very uh, succinct answers as well. Number one is what happened between Prophet Isa and the coming of Prophet Muhammad. May Allah bless him and his family and may Allah bless, bless Prophet Isa. Peace be upon him. Why? Question number two, why did Prophet Isa call the final Prophet Ahmad and not Muhammad? May Allah bless him and his family. And number three, well, what was the reaction by the people of the book to the arrival of the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, after Prophet, had, Prophet Isa had told his community about his future arrival? Now, for the answer to question number one, what was happening between the time of Isa, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family? Well, in chapter number 5, which is Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 19, the Qur'an actually speaks very clearly about a gap between prophets, specifically between the end of the mission of Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, on this earth when he was taken up into the heavens, and the beginning of the messengership of Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family. And in this verse, Allah says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, كَجَّاءَكُمْ رُسُلُنَا يُبَيِّنُ لَكُمْ عَلَىٰ فَتَرْتًا مِنَ الرُّسُلِ أَن تَكُولُوا مَا جَاءَنَا مِنْ بَشِيرٍ وَلَا نَذِيرٍ فَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بَشِيرٌ وَنَذِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ God says, O followers of the book, O Jews and Christians, indeed our messenger has come to you, explaining to you after a cessation of the mission of the messengers, lest you should say, there came not to us a giver of good tidings, or a warner. So indeed, there has come to you a giver of good news and a warner, and Allah has power over all things. Now this time period between the cessation of prophethood, of open, openly deputed and acknowledged prophets, between Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is known in the Quran as Fatra. This word fatra literally means quietness, tranquility, or a gap between two things. And so thus, this 600 or some odd year gap between the ascension of Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, into the heavens, alive, obviously he did not die, and the ba'athat, the appointment of Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, is what Allah is referring to in this verse as a period of fatra, a period of quietness, of no major messenger. A period of tranquility between two prophets, a gap between these two great men of God. However, keep in mind that this does not mean that there were no warners or guides or what we call the hujjah, the representatives of God upon this earth. Because according to Surah Yasin, verse number, chapter 36 rather, verse number 14, at least three or even up to four prophets were sent to guide humanity. These people who are mentioned in Surah Yasin were followers of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And they were what we would call also a messenger from God. Not with a new revelation or code of conduct. No, they followed the teachings of Prophet Jesus. They followed his religion, which was not Christianity. It was submission to God. It was Islam. But they were of a, uh, being sent by God. Another example that we know in the Quran is Prophet, Zah Prophet Yahya rather, and Zachariah, peace be upon both of them. These were both contemporaries of the time of Prophet Isa. So to say that there were no prophets between Nabi Isa and Prophet Muhammad, may Allah bless him and his family, is erroneous because at least Zah Yahya and Zachariah, peace be upon them, were at the time of Prophet Jesus. And as we said that there may be, well, there are others, but we don't know their names. The Quran does not speak about them in naming them. And hadith are also silent on this issue. In addition to that, we believe that all prophets leave behind divinely appointed successors. If we call them imams, well, these are divinely appointed guides that work in the absence of a directly appointed messenger from Allah. So there was a fatra in terms of a major cessation. But there were minor prophets and guides and representatives of God on this earth. Coming to question number two. Why, do, 
Why did the Qur'an, that is, why did Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, tell the community, the children of Israel, that a prophet will come after me, ismuhu Ahmad, his name will be Ahmad. You and I know him as Muhammad. May Allah bless him and his family. When we send our salawat, we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We don't say, Allahumma salli ala Ahmad wa Ali Ahmad. When we say the shahadatain, we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. We don't say, Ashadu anna Ahmadan Rasulullah. So why would Jesus use the name Ahmad here? Wouldn't this cause confusion? Couldn't the Jews and Christians of that time and even today say, your Quran is wrong? You call your prophet Muhammad. Why is he calling him Ahmad? If we don't believe in him, this is your fault. This is your Quran's fault because the Quran calls him Ahmad. Or Jesus at least, alayhi salam, calls him Ahmad. Our response to this, brothers and sisters, is very, uh, it's a very lengthy discussion. I'm just going to summarize it. But number one is we know that since childbirth, the Prophet was always known by two names. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, as we know because his father passed away before his birth. So his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, gave him the name Muhammad. However, his mother, Amina bint Wahab, may Allah be pleased with her, she gave her son the name Ahmad. So he had two names actually at birth, Muhammad and Ahmad. In addition, his uncle, his dearly beloved uncle Abu Talib, may God raise his rank in heaven. He would often and most often call his nephew Ahmad. And you know, there's a beautiful book that Abu Talib wrote called the Diwan of Abu Talib. Well, it's not a book he wrote, but rather it's a compilation of the poetry of Abu Talib, peace be upon him. The Diwan of Abu Talib, and this is actually available in English as well online. And so, for example, in one of the poems, Abu Talib, peace be upon him, writes... The oppressive ones had intended to kill Ahmad. However, they were not able to find anybody to take the lead on this act. And so, in multiple poetry, pieces of poetry from Abu Talib, peace be upon him, he kept calling his nephew Ahmad. Did he not know his name was Muhammad? Did he not know that the given, one of the given names was, was Muhammad? Obviously, he knew that he's, he's his uncle. He brought him up in his lap, in his house. He was fed from the Prophet, was fed from the food of Abu Talib. So obviously Abu Talib would know the name of his nephew. Another example is that Hisan ibn Thabit, the famous poet who lived during the time of the Messenger of Allah, may God bless him and his family, would also compose poetry. And he would refer to Rasulullah as Ahmad in that poetry. Another example of the proof of this name being so ubiquitous with the Prophet is that on the event of the Mi'raj, Allah would obviously was speaking to Rasulullah, and in most of the instances, he referred to him as Ahmad. And perhaps it's for this reason that, you know, speakers and narrators, they'll quote this line, where they'll say that when they send prayers on the Prophet, they'll say that the one who is known in the heavens as Ahmad, wa fil ard and on the earth as Abu al-Qasim and Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Moving on, another proof is the hadith from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. May God's peace and blessings be upon him, the fifth Imam. And he's been quoted as saying that indeed the Messenger of Allah has ten names. Five of which are in the Qur'an and five of them are not from the Qur'an. The Imam would then go on to say that as for those that are in the Qur'an, it's Muhammad. Because Allah refers to him as Muhammad in the Qur'an. It's Ahmad, it's Abdullah, it's Yasin and Noon. Noon wal kalami wa ma yasturun, for example. And as for the five names that are not in the Quran, they are Al Fatih, Al Khatam, Al Kaf, Al Muqaffi, and Al Hashir. So here we have a hadith, brothers and sisters, from the Imam, where he shows us that even Ahmad is a name of the Messenger of Allah. Now, moving on from here, you know, when the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, read this verse of Surah As Saf which says that Jesus said, there will, pro- there will be a prophet coming after me, after me, min ba'dihi, ismuhu Ahmad. When the prophet read this verse to the people of Mecca or Medina, when he read it to the Muslims and non-Muslims alike, to the Jews, the Christians, the polytheists especially, and to his companions, nobody, and that includes the Jews and Christians, none of them raised an ob- objection and said that, what are you saying, your name is not Ahmad? 
neither the lay people nor the scholars of, for example, the Jewish and Christian tradition. The Muslims of Medina, furthermore, never question Rasulullah, why is God calling you Ahmad? We don't know you as Ahmad. What, what name is this you, that you've concocted? No, they all recognize the Prophet as being named Ahmad. They may not have used it as a regular uh, word in their vocabulary when they called the Prophet, when they were speaking to him, but he was very well known. Otherwise, this could have been used against the Qur'an to prove the invalid invalidity of the Qur'an. The, the, the non-believers could say your Qur'an is a book of, is, is, is misguiding and it's wrong. But nobody ever said this. And number three, the answer to question number three, we know that the Qur'an makes it clear that in numerous verses, some of the Jews and Christians accepted the Prophet Muhammad. May God bless him and his family. They recognize him as a true prophet, true prophet of Allah. They recognize his message. They acknowledge that his message was in line with whatever they had left of their previous scriptures. They saw the signs of Nabuwa, of messengership in the messenger of God. May God bless him and his family. However, as we know, a majority of people rejected him and reduced his message to being magic. As the verse says that when he came to them, they said, Hada sihrum mubin. And so people, as the Qur'an quotes, some would call him majnoon, insane. Some would call him a sahir, a, uh, a magician, a fortune teller. Some would say that he's creating friction amongst the society and many other insults and taunts that they would use against the beloved Prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. However, we know that our beloved Prophet persisted in his mission and never gave up. And until today, Countless people, thousands upon thousands, millions perhaps, are finding his message, are leaving the path that they were born into to accept the Qur'an, to accept the oneness of Allah, and to accept the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and his family, as their final prophet and messenger of God. The Prophet would come into this world, however, he would not live to see his father, as we know. He would eventually lose his mother, as we'd mentioned. His grandfather would leave this world. And ultimately the Prophet would be thrown into a situation of being an orphan in the most difficult of circumstances. How did he deal with this loss? Who would take care of the Prophet? Who would take care of this young child whom his mother had named Ahmad? Whom his grandfather had called Muhammad? Who would take care of this young orphan in the city of Mecca? Who would help him grow and mature to be the man that, you know, were so prevalent in Mecca at that time. Well, to find out more of these answers on who would take care of the Prophet and bring him up in this critical juncture of his life, tune in tomorrow on the fifth day of the blessed month of Ramadan for Ramadan Reflections as we review this topic on the guardian of the Messenger of Allah. Until then, wassalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.